Hi everyone, I think after having this unusual lamp in my background for a year, you want to know how those lightning streaks in the test tubes are formed and how this device works. It's time for me to tell you about the surprising properties of different gases exposed to electric current. And I will also reveal the secret of the unusual panel behind my back. That's why, let's write in. I started exploring the behavior of different gases affected by high voltage with this plasma lamp that I was given as a birthday gift a long time ago. When this glass globe is turned down, there form beautiful lighting streaks coming out of the central electrode because there is a high voltage source inside the lamp that creates real plasma in flasks filled with some gas. I didn't know what the content of the gas inside such a glass flask was because the Chinese could have pumped anything inside it. This is why I had to find out through trial and error. For this purpose, I have already bought a more convenient high voltage source, which is a Tesla coil that you all know well, and that can produce a rather powerful electromagnetic field around itself, and it also creates a small bundle of plasma on the tip of the rod out of the ear. In order to find out what substance was used in my plasma lamp, I got an entire collection of different gases encased in glass ampules under loud pressure. This way it will be easier for them to glow around the high voltage source, which is my Tesla coil. A simple experiment can help us see the correlation between the brightness of glowing gas and the pressure it's under. I took a syringe with a sealed tip and started lowering the pressure inside it around the Tesla coil. As soon as the air inside the syringe got to the finished state, at one point there formed a glow discharge that consists of the four states of matter, or in other words, plasma. Just like the air, that is mostly made up of nitrogen, pure nitrogen inside a gas ampule under lowered pressure, glows bright violet next to a Tesla coil. And oxygen in such an ampule glows with a whitish color. This happens due to the ionization of gas molecules under the influence of a strong electromagnetic field, which is why plasma is formed. The lower the pressure inside the vessel filled with gas, the easier it is to form plasma. This is why the globe from my old plasma lamp definitely wasn't filled with the air. What gas what is then? To find out, let us see this setup that I put together myself using purchased ampules shaped in the form the initials of different noble gases that are filled with the very same gases under lower pressure. We can see that when high voltage transformer applies 6 kW electricity, helium and neon glows quite bright and their glow differs drastically from the glow of the plasma in this globe. This is why I think that these gases are definitely not present in it. However, argon, krypton and xenon glow quite dull and they are almost of the same color. Hmm, could it be that my globe is filled with these gases? I think for the final test we need to learn what color these gases glow in small ampules placed close to Tesla coils. Because of the high energy that is needed to create a plasma arc in argon and krypton medium, the ampules glowed with a brighter color when placed next to the Tesla coil. That's why the plasma color of these gases is almost white and it depends on the applied voltage. By the way, I nearly failed to make the xenon glow because of these gas heavy molecules that turned into beautiful bluish plasma. By the way, this color really resembles the color of the plasma in my lamp. Evidently either the Chinese were quite generous with highly expensive xenon or they pumped an unknown mixture of noble gases, the precise composition of which we are unlikely to know. By the way, while I was playing around with the Tesla coil, which can also play music through a corona discharge, I noticed a very strange smell that the plasma formed on the tip of the electrode gave off. It resembles ozone and something else. To see if my guesses are accurate, I bought a special device that measures ozone concentration in the air, and I put it next to the working Tesla coil. 
Barely two minutes into the experiment, the device immediately began to detect a high concentration of ozone in the air, even though I could hardly smell it with my nose. If you cover the working device with a Tesla coil with an aquarium, the ozone concentration will start exceeding the critical level in just several minutes. This is why you should ventilate the working space well when working with such high voltage devices, because high concentration of ozone is very damaging to the lungs and is often formed from the oxygen in the air next to some electric appliances, for instance such as an old TVs. Also it forms in thunderstorms when the lightning strikes. This is why you can often smell a so-called fresh scent after rain, which in reality is the smell of ozone in low concentration. By the way, you can use some components from an old TVs, for instance such a high voltage transformer, in order to put together an unusual high voltage generator, which just like a Tesla coil can generate plasma, but in the latter case is generated between two electrodes. Because of the higher electric current and frequency, such plasma happens to be hotter and can work as lighter and can even be used to play music. It's worthy of note that I almost could not smell ozone when I was close to the working device. Evidently, because of the very hot arc, it mostly broke down. However, my nose could smell something else. Perhaps another gas is released in such a hot electric arc. We just need to detect it somehow. To do that, I assembled a special setup made up of a high voltage transformer for neon lamps connected with a laboratory outer transformer and do it yourself copper electrodes. As soon as I start spinning the handle of Variac, there starts forming a high voltage plasma arc between the copper electrodes. The higher the voltage is, the higher the temperature of the arc is, and it can reach several thousand degrees Celsius. This is why I made electrodes in the shape of springs, in order for them to better release the heat and not to overheat. Now I'm covering my setup with a regular glass jar and turning on the electric arc. Then I am observing the color of the gas inside the jar against a white background. Interestingly, as the time went by, the gas started turning russet, which closely resembles the color of nitrogen dioxide, which is also released when copper reacts with nitric acid. Turns out, this is what is released besides ozone during this process and has a slightly sour smell. This gas is none other than nitrogen dioxide, which is the product of the reaction of oxygen with nitrogen from the air. At such a high temperature of the arc and with electrons and ions flowing between the electrodes, usually inert nitrogen from the air can react with oxygen and, depending on the conditions, can form either nitrogen dioxide or nitrogen monoxide. In other words, you can simply set the air on fire in a hot electric arc, that is, you can make its components react with each other. I'm curious to know if this reaction has some practical application. To study this question, A gave me an initial setup and addition, connecting an aquarium air pump to the jar. I will try to pass the air coming out of the jar through water, dyed with an universal indicator, which will change color depending on the acidity of the solution. When I add regular water, the indicator turns yellow, because the medium is almost neutral. I am adding a couple of drops of sodium hydroxide, which is a strong alkali, into the solution, in order to change the color of the indicator. After doing that, the solution turns bright violet. Now I'm running the transformer again until there is a stable yellow arc in the jar. After that, I start passing air through it and feeding it through the solution along with the released nitrogen dioxide. It's interesting how some time later the color of the indicator started changing, which means that when nitrogen dioxide dissolves in the solution, there forms nitric and nitrous acids that change the acidity of the solution. Thus, you can obtain rather precious nitric acid from regular air just by passing it through an electric arc and then dissolving it in water, for instance, as it's done in this cylinder for improving the effectiveness. As you may know, nitric acid is an indispensable reagent that is used in the production of fertilizers and many other useful chemicals. Such a method of obtaining nitric acid and fixation of atmospheric nitrogen was actually used extensively in Norway in the early 20th century, because at that time electricity produced by hydropower plants was quite cheap. To increase efficiency, plasma arcs used to be coated inside special reactors, and the obtained nitrogen dioxide was dissolved in water several times. However, it turned out that the so-called Birkland-Eyed process 
had low efficiency from the electricity consumption point of view, and beginning in the 1920s, it began to be substituted with a more efficient nitrogen fixation method, in which the reaction of hydrogen and nitrogen on an iron catalyst was used. Nevertheless, I decided to attempt obtaining as much nitric acid as possible using this method. For this purpose, I left my device to work for two days under a fume hood. I'm going to cool off my jar reactor with a regular computer fan in order for it not to get overheated by the hot electric arc. So, about two days later, I decided to stop the experiment and check the result. If we take a little bit of the obtained solution from the cylinder and drop it on an indicator strip, we'll see well how acidic the solution is. It means a certain amount of nitric acid did accumulate in my solution. The obtained acid can be neutralized, for instance, by regular baking soda, and we can get sodium nitrate solutions this way, which is quite a widespread nitric fertilizer and doesn't change the soil acidity. After neutralizing the acid, I'm testing the acidity level, or in other words, pH, with the help of an indicator strip. As we can see, almost all acid in the solution has turned into sodium nitrate, because the medium of the solution is neutral. After that, I decided to vaporize all the remaining water and extract pure sodium nitrate, or in other words, child saltpeter from this solution. Just like all nitrates, my do-it-yourself sodium nitrate is a rather strong oxidizer, and when mixed with regular sugar, the obtained mixture burns actively if ignited. But still, from a chemical point of view, sodium nitrate is a rather boring chemical. That's why I decided to synthesize a real jet engine fuel component from this do-it-yourself reagent, which is fuming nitric acid. To do that, I took a small amount of sodium nitrate and poured it into a cone flask. And after that, I added some sulfuric acid to the mixture. At that moment, nothing seemed to be happening in the flask. However, even at room temperature, some sodium nitrate started turning into sodium bisulfate and pure nitric acid after reacting with sulfuric acid. In order to separate it from other chemicals, I decided to distill the content of the flask with the help of a setup for simple distillation that is frequently used in chemistry laboratories. Once the mixture heated up, it began to fill the flask with nitric acid vapor that began to rise higher in the setup and get into the condenser, where they turned into pure fuming nitric acid of such yellow color, which results from the nitrogen dioxide impurities in it. Because pure nitric acid boils at 120 degrees Celsius, and sulfuric acid does at 330 degrees, it's very easy to separate these two acids using this method. Also, it's possible only if you have a fume hood and know certain things. That's why it's better not to repeat this experiment on your own. After about an hour of distillation, the receiving flask filled with a small amount of nitric acid, which fumed in the air, even through the receiving tip. When exposed to the air, concentrated nitric acid fumes a lot. In other words, it forms acidic aerosol with the air moisture. That's why it's not at all good for health to inhale such vapor. One interesting property of such concentrated nitric acid is that it both corrodes and ignites many substances. For instance, this pair of construction gloves turned into a mesh in just several minutes. If we drop nitric acid on something more flammable, for instance on air balloons, nitric acid will start reacting with latex that is present in them very actively. Eventually it will set them on fire. More or less the same thing will happen to regular latex gloves that are frequently used in medicine. That's why it's a bad idea to mess around with concentrated nitric acid. Because not only does it corrode many materials, but also speeds up their burning, serving as a strong oxidizer. This is why when nitric acid is added to burning latex, its burning drastically increases. Also, a napkin soaked in nitric acid will burn much faster than a napkin lying in the air. Besides simple burning experiments, fuming nitric acid mixed with nitrogen dioxide is used as an oxidizer in some liquid rocket engines, especially in those designed by Nazi Germany during the Second World War. However, by passing electric discharge through some gases, it can create not only some destructive chemicals, but we can also create something beautiful, 
For instance, if we fill a regular light bulb with a mixture of neon and argon, then we can make a beautiful glowing night light, which will glow thanks to a glow discharge on top of electrodes. During the Soviet era, a lot of neon light bulbs were made that work as an indicators, like this DN20 light bulb, which I used to make such a beautiful room lamp, just like I did with the other Chinese light bulb. Neon along with other inert gases are still used in many street retro signs, just like in this do-it-yourself setup, but only at low pressure. You can make something similar to a neon sign just by running high voltage current through regular air at low pressure. To make such a lamp, I'm just sucking out the air with the help of a vacuum pump from the such a do-it-yourself setup. At the same time, I'm applying 7 kV current to the copper electrodes inside the glass tube. As soon as the pressure drops, beautiful violet plasma starts glowing inside, made of ionized air particles. First it creates arc discharge, and then, as the pressure drops, it turns into glow discharge. It's interesting to see how the color of the plasma changes when the pressure drops. Evidently, nitrogen starts glowing first, and then, when air gets sucked out, oxygen does. Its color slightly resembles that of aurora. In order to check whether or not I have really got plasma, I'm placing a magnet close to it, which makes the glow of charged particles wander off under the influence of the magnetic field. However, it wasn't air that was used in the making of this lamp behind me, rather it was xenon, an expensive gas that was pumped under the pressure exceeding the atmospheric pressure dozens of times. This lamp is made of two Soviet Dekaisha xenon lamps, one Dekaisha 500 lamp and one more small lamp filled with krypton under pressure. Initially, these lamps were meant to be used in movie projectors or for pumping solid-state lasers, for instance such as this krypton lamp, but nowadays you can no longer find such lasers and movie projectors in sale. But there left are lots of lamps, this is why I decided to just link them in series and connect to regular neon light transformer. In my opinion, it turned out to look quite decent. It's a pity through that because of the quartz glass, a small amount of ozone is released when such lamps work. That's why I try not to keep this lamp working for too long. It's worthy of note that glowing happens not only in gases with electric arcs, but also in some metals. For instance, if we take a piece of metallic sodium and heat it up with the help of an argon arc in a special ampule made of semi-transparent ceramic based on aluminum oxide, in some time sodium will melt and then vaporize and its vapors will start glowing bright yellow under the influence of electricity. For example, in these very lamps that are still used in street lights, although nowadays they are being substituted with more energy-efficient light-emitting diodes that produced more natural light. Besides sodium, mercury glows too under low pressure when placed next to a Tesla coil, emitting rather hardcore ultraviolet light. You can even make non-metals glow under low pressure. For instance, this ampule contains sulfur with mercury vapor. If you just bring an ampule close to a Tesla coil, the mercury vapor will immediately start glowing. But if we heat the ampule a bit, then the sulfur will start vaporizing, and eventually its vapor will turn into plasma and will start glowing with a beautiful white color, the spectrum of which closely resembles that of sunlight. By the way, there exists another device that makes beautiful plasma in the air, besides Tesla coil. It is so-called torch discharge generator that the hamster time channel gladly sent for me for my experiments. What's interesting about this device is that it can create an extremely hot glow of plasma on the tip of the electrode. Its temperature can reach 12,000 degrees Celsius, which is why electrodes made of regular steel easily burn when the torch discharge generator works. If we use indium metal instead of steel, which is a very soft and malleable metal, and make an electrode for torch discharge generator from it, then for several seconds we can see beautiful indigo plasma made of indium ions. It's quite entertaining. Nowadays, such combustible properties of plasma are used in many devices, ranging from various types of welding machines to plasma cutters that can melt the most refractory metal, which is tungsten. 
Well, I think after watching this video, you'll know more about plasma discharge and how some gauges can behave under the influence of a high voltage. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to see many more new and interesting.